Good morning, everybody. I want to invite you this morning to open up the Lord's Word with us. We'll be in the Sermon on the Mount. This is Matthew chapter 5. We'll pick up with verse 27 in just a minute. So as you know, we are going through the Sermon on the Mount, this greatest of all sermons. And as Moses went up the mountain and brought down the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law to the people, so Jesus goes up on the mountain and he brings his disciples with him. And being the very Son of God, he gives the Word of God directly to them and directly to us. His text is all of Scripture, all of the Old Testament. And his theme is uh, the, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven here on earth. What it means when God reigns in the hearts of of his people. And this is what Jesus is preaching about in this great sermon. Now this morning we're going to take a look at three different things that he mentions, but they all have a, 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 a theme that connects them, and, it, and it's truthfulness. It's remaining true to, to what we say and, and, and remaining true to the Lord and others in our actions. Uh, in this we have Jesus as our example. He came to earth. He died for our sins. He rose again, and he gave us his spirit, enabling us to become part of the kingdom of heaven and to live like we are a part of the kingdom of heaven. Well, with that in mind, let us turn to scripture this morning. So this is Matthew 5, pick up of verse 27. This is Jesus speaking to the crowd there in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said, that you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than for your whole body go into hell. Now, these are strong words from the Lord, and it's a difficult subject to talk about here. Um, adultery and, and committing adultery, that was one of the Ten Commandments. Remember, that was commandment number seven. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, Jesus is pointing out to us that the very act of adultery, well, you know, that, that's a sin, but, but truly the sin begins before we even get there. It begins with the thoughts that lead to adultery. Uh, there, there's another commandment, commandment number 10, that says, Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife. So Jesus is interpreting uh, the, the seventh commandment with the tenth commandment, and he's bringing it uh, t- to the inside. He's internalizing this. It's not just the action. It's the thoughts and the heart that leads to the action. Now, we know what adultery is. I don't need to give a clinical definition of it here this morning. And we understand why this is bad. We are breaking um, our word to our spouse when this occurs. What we may not quite realize is that the thoughts that lead to it, well, they are so destructive in their own right. And that's why Jesus says, and he uses hyperbole here, but he says, uh, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to lose this part of your body than to be shackled to this sin and to have it drag you down into hell. Now, what is he talking about and what is he not talking about? Is he talking about the fleeting thoughts that go through our mind that could lead us to sexual sin? No, he's not. He's not talking about the temptation He's talking about dwelling upon the temptation. He's talking about allowing the temptation to draw us in. Uh, In this case, this would be prolonged thoughts. This would be um, thoughts that we are not casting aside, but in fact are embracing. That's really what he's talking about here. Um, And it is this that we need to be so very careful about. It It is this that our reaction needs to be plucking the eye out if necessary. Okay, well, is it necessary to pluck out eyes and cut off limbs? Well, early church 
leaders thought that perhaps Jesus was not talking with, with hyperbole here, but, but talking literally. And so we have in the second century quite a movement of holy church fathers cutting off parts of their bodies in order to wrestle with this sin. Uh, there was one well-known one. His name was Origen. That's where we, that's the origin of the name Origen, uh, what was this gentleman. Um, and and he, he took one of these drastic actions. What he discovered and what the early church discovered is you can cut off your hand, you can pluck out eyes. The sin lies, however, in here. It's, it's really the heart, and we can't pluck out our heart. Uh, we can't cut this out. Um, this requires divine surgery. Uh, it is the Lord that is required to circumcise our, our hardened hearts and give us a, a new heart. And, and Jesus does this by, by giving us his spirit. Okay, But that doesn't mean that we cannot act when we are confronted with these kind of temptations. I mentioned last week that when confronted with the temptation of, of anger, one of the things that I have learned to do is, is I'll, I'll recite a, a memory verse that, that I've memorized, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, uh, 22. Um, that is a technique that can work here. If we are tempted with thoughts that we know are not right, that are impure, the way we can change what we are thinking about is to think on him. And a way to do that is to have a, a verse memorized. That It can be kind of our touchstone verse. It doesn't have to be the one that I have, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. It can be something else, John 3, 16. Whatever it is that we have handy and ready, something to break the thought process. And uh, as we get in the habit of doing this, this becomes um, something that we can turn to, and it becomes something that becomes, well, effective. This is something we can do. Now, I will, I would be derelict if, if I moved on from, from these verses without discussing something that's quite a problem here in the 21st century, and that is pornography. It, of course, has always been around. It uh, certainly in my lifetime has been never, it's never been easier to access than it is now with, with the internet and everything that we have. Um, the Lord doesn't want you to go off go around plucking out eyes and cutting off hands. However, he wants you to understand how serious this problem can become. We, the more we learn about pornography, the more we see how addictive it is, and the more we see how addictive it can become at a young age. And it's both sexes, actually, that, that can be uh, uh, affected by this. Um, so we're not going to be cutting off hands, but what can we be doing? Um, is it better to cut off our access to the internet than to be shackled to this sin? I mean, these are the questions that the Lord is raising in our minds. And the answer, of course, is yes. It is much better to do these kind of drastic things than to be shackled with sin and have them draw us away from the Lord. Is it better to tackle our embarrassment and go to a godly friend and ask them to be an accountability partner for us? than to be shackled to the sin and have it draw us down and away from the Lord? Well, the answer is yes, it is. There are things that we can do to combat this. They are difficult. They can be embarrassing. It takes courage. However, here's where we see the Lord's strong words. It is better to wrestle with these things, to try these what we might consider scary or drastic measures, it's better to do that than to remain shackled in sin and to have this drag us away from the Lord. If this is a situation that you are dealing with, no matter where you may be, it would be better for you to find a godly person whom you trust to act as an accountability partner. Uh, at the end of the service, I will throw my email address up there. I can help you in this. Um, but let us hear the Lord's words, his powerful words here, that we need to be careful. Now, before we move on, let, let's mention this from, from a parental point of view. Um, it is our responsibility as parents to guide our children into maturity and to help them manage their devices that they use and their access to the Internet and their potential access to pornography and other destructive things that are there. Um, as we stand before the Lord... Uh, they, they kind of, our children stand before us and, and uh, 
they are obligated to give an accounting to us for how they use these things. And we owe them the knowledge of how they can grow in the use of these without descending into sin. So it is okay. And in fact, I would say it is imperative to monitor your children's use of the internet. And it is imperative that you train them how to use these tools, like we would teach them how to use power tools. They are just as dangerous. So let us take the Lord's um, words on this matter quite seriously. Now let's move on to the next subject that he brings up. This is verse 31. It, is also, it was also said, excuse me, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now we may think that we invented no fault divorce. We didn't. That, that idea has been around for a very long time. In fact, it's basically what they practice in the first century world. The very people that Jesus is addressing here, uh, they could divorce for no reason, much like we can today. Uh, if you've done any extensive Bible studies on this passage, you will see that, that their divorce laws were very much favored, uh, the, 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 the men in that situation. And so a man didn't have to do much of anything to divorce his wife. He could claim that, that she had aged over the years and, and use that as an excuse to divorce her. Uh, the fact that he aged as well uh, was, was of no uh, material uh, in, in such a case. So they really could divorce for, for any particular reason. Um, they, they would have to write out a statement saying that they were divorced. And then uh, the, the, the woman who was set free uh, from the marriage, uh, she carried this certificate that said that she was now available to any man to, to, to take on a new relationship. Uh, Jesus addresses this, and he says, no, this is not okay. He says, when we are divorcing for all these reasons, and, and he does give the caveat of sexual immorality, of unfaithfulness as being a legitimate reason, and the only legitimate reason to divorce, anything else is not okay. Um, uh, he is saying that, that we are breaking, and, and they were breaking God's created order when they were divorcing for, for flippant reasons. Uh, what was God's created order? Um, God said that in the beginning, uh, he created us male and female, and the man shall leave his parents and Come to the woman, and the two shall become one flesh. God created this, and, and he brought them together. Now, in the 50 years or so since we have had no-fault divorce laws here in America, this, this national experiment, uh, well, we haven't stopped there. We have gone on since then to completely redefine what marriage is so that we can include homosexual relationships in, in the covenant of marriage, which of course, was not a part of God's creative plan. We have gone on beyond that to say that not only um, will we do that, but we will create ourselves in our own image instead of being created in God's image. He created us male and female. We are rejecting that, and we are coming up with multiple different categories that we want, uh, that we want to use to define ourselves. Um, all of this goes against God's created order. Now, some would say that Jesus doesn't speak specifically about the kind of things that we are talking about here, the, the things that have happened in our nation in the last few years. But, but this really isn't the case. He is speaking about it here. He speaks about it in an extended format in the 19th chapter of Matthew. And if you wish, you can go there and take a look at that. But basically what Jesus says there in, in Matthew 19, he reiterates what the Lord said in Genesis, which was, God created us. He created us male, he created us female. And we come together, male and female, in marriage, and the two become one flesh. This is a part of God's creation. And so when we are breaking the marriage covenant, we are breaking what God has set aside uh, as his rules for creation. And we have seen in the last 50 or so years how this has been a series of dominoes that has started to fall all throughout our society. So we have been living like this for 50 years, and what that means is that there are many of us who have now gone through divorces, 
and many of us have gone through divorces and have remarried. What would the Lord say to us in our situation now? Well, what he would say to us is, is what he said back then. No, nothing has changed here. Uh, if we are divorcing each other for reasons that are not unfaithfulness, then yes, we are, we are sinning. And we are causing our former marriage partner to sin. And then we are sinning with, with our, 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 our current partner. However, it was for such sins that Jesus came to die. He hung on the cross because we haven't been faithful to each other, because we are divorcing without biblical reasons, because we are lusting after each other, people who don't belong to us, all these kind of things. It was for this reason that Jesus hung on the cross. It was, it was then that God poured out judgment on him instead of on us for these crimes. And because of his great action, we can be forgiven, and we can be forgiven for this sin as well. And so if we have divorced in the past, um, and the reasons have not been biblical reasons, if we haven't asked God to forgive us in the past, let us ask him to forgive us now. And what we need to do now then is to remain faithful in the relationship that we are in right now. If we have remarried, we need to remain faithful in that marriage relationship and do what we didn't do in the past and call upon the Lord to help us with his spirit within us, calling on him, yes, we can do this. We can remain faithful to those we are uh, married to. So we have seen now two examples of the Lord calling us to task for for not being faithful, Uh, not being faithful to our spouse when we lust after someone else, not being faithful to our spouse when we divorce them for no reason. And, and we aren't being faithful to the Lord when we do these things as well. Now, there's a third uh, category he's going to bring up here of, of being unfaithful, of being untruthful. Uh, and it begins with verse 33. Again, you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So in this third example, Jesus is talking about um, swearing oaths. Um, you know, we, we, we on the surface kind of know what he means here, but, but we need to understand a little bit about the society at that time to, to really get the situation that he, uh, in our mind that he's tackling here. Uh, at that time, they had a series of different oaths that people could take of um, ascending potency, if you will, uh, to, to swear that, that something would be done or they would make good on a debt or, or whatever it, it would be. And you see Jesus giving some of these here. Swearing by heaven, swearing by the throne of God. There was, they, they would swear by the altar in front of the temple. They would swear by their own head. That They, they had a, um, an oath that, that um, may I lose my head, may it come off of my body if I don't keep my word, th- th- these kind of things. And so they, they would do this, and um, they would, um, it was almost like a series of lawyer's tricks that, that they had. Uh, you could swear an oath to the Lord or, or by the Lord, and they thought that that would mean that you had to keep your word to him, but I could break my word to you and yet still keep my word to him by swearing a particular kind of oath. But there's another kind of oath that I could swear, which would mean I'd have to keep my word to you, but I could break my word to the Lord. You see how they would make these different categories to kind of help them get out of stuff they didn't want to do. So that, that's what they were doing. I, I think of the uh, Christmas movie, the, the, the Christmas story where the little boy wants the BB gun. And uh, if, if you're familiar with that movie, there's the, there's the scene where the kids are daring one another to, to stick their tongue to the frozen light pole. And the, the, the voiceover narration goes through the, um, the protocols that were inherent in children daring each other to do that. There's the 
There's the, the, the double dare. There's the double dog dare. There's the triple dare you. And then finally, there's the coup de gras, the triple dog dare. Well, they had oaths that were kind of like that. And they make about as much sense, okay? Now, it's interesting, though, the reason Jesus gives for not swearing these kind of oaths. Now, on the surface, it makes sense not to do that. But when we're standing outside of that culture, it, it just seems duplicitous to us. Um, but he gives us another reason not to do it. Uh, look here at verse 36. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. I mentioned before that was one of the oaths they had. You know, may I lose my head if I don't keep my word, if I don't pay you back by such and such a date. What Jesus is saying here is, how do you know you're going to keep your head anyway? You're not master of your own fate. You have no idea what's going to happen in the future. This reminds us of what James would say in, in James chapter 4, where he would say, you know, we run around saying, we're going to go here and do this, and we're going to travel here and do that. And what we ought to be saying is, if the Lord wills, we're going to go here and do this. We're going to travel here and do that. And boy, over the last year, if, if, if there's anything I've learned, it's the truth of, of, of James chapter 4. We, we really don't know what the future holds, and we don't know if it is possible for us to even be here in six months' time, let alone pay back someone that we are swearing we're going to pay back to. So Jesus says, tackle this problem with a little humility and simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Okay? Don't run around saying, okay, I know in the past I haven't really been truthful, but this time I'm going to swear by God in heaven so you know I'm going to keep my word. Don't run around uh, living a life that uh, we don't really give a whole lot of thought to our actions, but then when we're pressured, we say, well, I swear on my mother's life. No, no, no. You have no idea what the future holds. What would be better is just to live honest lives and let your actions prove you honest and let your no simply stand for no and your yes simply stand for yes. Now, what is Jesus not talking about here? Is it wrong to take all oaths? Well, not necessarily. There are some occasions where we really do need to do this. Uh, we've been speaking of marriage. Uh, the first two examples... Uh, uh, dealt with uh, adultery and, and divorce. Um, both of these go against wedding vows that, that we make to each other when we stand before the Lord and our friends and family uh, in a wedding ceremony. Now, marriage was instituted by the Lord. We see God, and as he says in Genesis, he created us male and female, and, and the two shall come and, and become one flesh. And we see the very first wedding uh, happen much like we do it today, God brought Eve to Adam like a father brings the bride down the, the center aisle of a church to, to, for a wedding ceremony. God gave us that, okay? He instituted it. And so it is not just okay, it is fitting and proper to swear to each other before the Lord and, 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 and our family that, yes, we will be faithful to each other till death do us part. So that would be an occasion where, yes, these kind of things are, are not just permissible, but, but in fact necessary and, and godly. Uh, there are other occasions when we are uh, in a court of law. Um, our, our society requires us to do this. And, and once again, to provide justice and be a part of that is a godly thing. And so, yes, it is okay to, to be sworn in to a jury, to, to swear be sworn in to the jury stand and, and so forth. We, we participate in that kind of public business. And, and also, for, for those of us who have been a part of the military, we know that that, 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 uh, that, that is a part of the process there. And yes, that, that is okay as well. That's, that not, that's not what the Lord is really talking about here. What the Lord is talking about here is the human desire to say, yes, I'm totally going to do that, while we have our fingers crossed behind our back. That's really what he's talking about here. And what's the antidote to that? Okay, it's not to come up with better oaths, more specific oaths that will let us out of what we don't want to do. Now, 
the, 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 the better form here, the godly way to go about this is, of course, to live honest lives. To live honest, honest lives and have our actions speak for us and have our yes be understood by people to mean yes, that will happen. Yes, I will do that. And our no mean no, that's not okay. I'm not going to do that. And, and go on from there. Now, we are in the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount pictures what the kingdom of heaven looks like. The kingdom of heaven is made up of people who belong to the Lord. And we take a look at some of these ethical standards, and they're just greater than the standards of any legal code that any society has. And many have looked at these standards and said, this is impossible. We can't, we can't hold this up. You know, we, we can't we can't live on lies, okay? That's why we have oaths. We can't, um, you know, we, we can't uh, be faithful to our, our, our spouses, which is why we have divorce, so forth and, and so on. Uh, and, and, and some theologians would even say that when Jesus is preaching on the kingdom of heaven here in the Sermon on the Mount, he is talking about what conditions are going to be like after he returns again and after all things are remade. Um, but even though that certainly will be the case, it, it is clear that Jesus is calling upon his disciples now to act in this manner. Can we do it by ourselves? Of course not. But we have Jesus as our, uh, as our example. And so we began this message this morning with Jesus. Let us conclude this message by returning to our Lord. Jesus shows us what faithfulness means. He came to earth, the very Son of God, on a rescue mission to find us and to save us as a shepherd searches for a lost sheep. He was tempted to deviate from this mission, but he remained faithful to the will of his Father in heaven. He went to the cross. He bore our shame our guilt, God's righteous wrath and judgment was poured out upon him in our place. And there he died. But God accepted his sacrifice. Jesus arose on the third day. He ushered in a new kind of life, resurrection life. And he invites us now to become a part of the kingdom of heaven, to become a part of the kingdom of God. And in doing so, when we kneel down before the cross, when we ask for forgiveness of our sins, the sins we have mentioned this morning and others, we are forgiven. And he gifts us with his very spirit, which begins the process of remaking us, not in our image, but in his image, making us more like Christ each and every day. It is a struggle. It is hard work. We got a big fat word called sanctification that describes all of this. It's not easy, but it is possible, and it is what we are called to. So the things that we've mentioned this morning, the dealing with lustful thoughts uh, exacerbated by our Internet age, the, the dealing with uh, the desire to not remain faithful to our spouses, to move on, to, to break relationships, the the temptation to not live honest lives, with the help of his spirit, we can reverse that and we can begin to move forward there. And Jesus has shown us the path. He has demonstrated faithfulness to us and he calls us to be a part of that as well. Now, it may be that we need help in doing this, not just the Lord's help, but the help of each other. As I mentioned before, it is much better for us to seek that help, even if it's embarrassing, than to be shackled to sin for the rest of our lives. Let us hear the words of the Lord. Let us turn to him. Let us be set free. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for something else. We thank you for confronting us in our sin. We could never be set free 
if you did not call us to task like you have done this morning with your word. Father God, for those of us who are tempted to impure thoughts, dear Lord, I pray that you would help us to confess those to you and you would give us the the spirit to help see us through that, but also means um, practical ways in which we can, can break that, Lord, and people to walk alongside us. Father God, I lift up prayers for all of our marriages, marriages that are represented in this room, marriages that are represented in all of the homes that are with us this morning, Father God. I pray your strengthening hand would be upon our marriages, that we would desire as as couples before you to grow closer to each other and to grow closer to you throughout all the remaining days of our lives. And Father, I pray that we would be known here in church and where you take us in our communities, at work, at schools, wherever, as trustworthy, honest people, and that as such we can be salt and light in the world around us, and that your name, Lord Jesus, would be lifted high. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your example. Help us to be part of your kingdom. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, that we pray. Amen.